Good evening, everyone. It's good to be here again for another one of our patient health workshop sessions. Um, it's a little bit uh, drizzly outside, and I'm grateful for that because it's been pretty dry for the last few um, months, and it's it's welcomed rain. It's welcomed rain. So I know if you're traveling on your way home right now and have to be in the traffic during the time when it's raining it's never a good thing because um, the rain itself causes a lot of people on the road to drive like them don't have any sense now since you're here you know watching us and participating clearly we're not talking about you but we're talking about those crazy drivers who as soon as the rain fall them start to drive like them you know messed up hi auntie melissa how you do all right um so yeah i just want to make sure hold on i see something an issue here is there an issue Oh, good. No issue. All right. So make sure you can all hear me well. I think um, I should be, you know, my audio should be good. And once I get confirmation that my audio is good, we shall rock and roll. So anyone going to confirm? I just type it in the chat. If you can hear me okay, just let me know so I can, we can get started. All right, perfect. Excellent, excellent. So, good. All right, so shall we begin? The topic is seven keys to getting and staying well. I have actually pinned a message or a comment in the comment section that has a link in it. You may follow that link or use that link to um, get you to our handout that goes with the class. So the handout that you shall receive if you follow the link is one that has the blanks already filled in for you. So it should make your life a lot easier. If you are those people who are really tech savvy or you know clicking a link is too difficult for you to do you can also just take a pic of this qr code and scan it into your phones and it should take you also to the form so let us begin shall we as we're looking at the whole issue the topic is the seven keys to getting and staying well we're going to go through seven individual steps or things that one needs to know or do um, that kind of fits into the whole lecture to help you to make wise choices for not only yourself but also for your family, um, anybody who you have responsibility over. All right, so the first key that we're going to discuss is sick care versus health care. And as we look into the differences between the two, um, we should recognize that there, there, is, there are two types of persons that, will, that exist, really. And it's based on the health continuum. Now, with the health continuum, you have on the one hand, you have death and disease on the one hand. And on the other end of the continuum, you have, so, well, other way around, you have death and disease on one end, and on the other end, you have optimal health and vitality. So the bottom is death and disease, the top is optimal health and vitality. If you are moving toward optimal health, we call that a direction of wellness. However, if you're moving toward death and disease, we call that a state of illness. 
So illness is getting worse where you're moving toward death and disease, whereas wellness is moving toward optimal health and life, vitality. So that's what we mean between the difference between wellness and illness. Now, if you are in the habit of caring for the healthy or the well, then we call this really what true healthcare is and what true healthcare really should aspire to do is to keep the population as healthy as possible. And the only way to keep the population healthy is to have a population of patients that are healthy. Because if you wait until disease has set in, then you can no longer keep people healthy. You have to restore them to good health. So the goal is, how can we keep people healthy? We keep people healthy by making healthy persons our focus. Unfortunately, this is not what the healthcare industry that we know it today is about. And it's not unfortunate necessarily because of a right or wrong or better or worse kind of a thing. Um, because at the end of the day, there is a benefit to what they do. Now, because of the nature of how things are in our world, we will have sick people because you have many things that can cause illness. You can also have people who suffer traumas and so on. So we need a system to care for those persons. But caring for the sick is what we call sick care. Optimizing health, caring for the healthy among us, we call that true health care. And there is a difference. I'm going to talk about some of these differences right now. So when we look at it, Sick care is considered to be reactive care. What do we mean by reactive care? It means that we are waiting for something to go wrong first and then we're going to apply an intervention to try to correct or restore something that has already gone bad. So this is the idea of reacting or being reactive in your approach. Well, if you want true healthcare where your goal, your goal is to keep people as healthy as possible, then you have to make choices before things go wrong. <laughs> when we make choices before things go wrong, we call that being proactive. So on the one hand, you're waiting until things break up, fall apart, and then you're going to act. On the other hand, you're acting before things fall apart. Which is better? It depends on who the person is that you're caring for. Because if it's somebody sick that comes into your room and you're trying to be proactive, it might not help them because they're already sick. So the reactionary approach does benefit those who need it. But if we want to have true health care, where we are getting people not just to be free of disease, but to, up, to, to experience the fullness of life, we have to move to a more proactive approach. Now, there is a health crisis that exists according to the current model of waiting for things to go wrong first. The crisis that exists is that the number one killers of persons in the world, they are not killed because of um, a lack of surgery or a lack of, of um, medications, right? Drugs and surgery can't solve the main problem of health in our world. The main cause of health exists because of poor lifestyle choices. And when we say poor choices, I'm not trying to be judgmental in, 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 in that, but a poor choice doesn't necessarily have to be a choice that you made knowingly. In other words, some people make poor choices. They choose a negative thing or a bad thing, even though they know what the good thing is. But there are people who make poor choices without knowing what the right choice is. And if they knew what the right choice was, they probably would make a right choice. But they make poor choices because they're not aware of what the better choice would be. My purpose for today is trying to present to you what a better choice might be so that you can make wiser choices. And if you make wiser choices, you will benefit, your children will benefit, whoever it is that you're caring for will benefit, whether it's your child or your parent. Um, I belong to what we call the gap generation because in my generation now, my age range now, we are in the middle sandwich between our aging parents and our growing children. And so we are caring for two distinct um, 
facets of our society. So we're in that gap generation, if you will. And that's okay. That's okay. Now, the way people think is what determines how they act. I'll say that again because it's important to recognize. The way you think determines how you act. You have to... There's a principle that we learned when I was in chiropractic school called the be, do, have principle. Most people who live in a lack world or from a position of lack, they operate in the opposite direction. Have, um, do, and be. Or at the very worst, uh, worse, do, have, and be. Now, being is a state, the state of being is a state of your current state, your state of being, your internal state, your internal self, if you will. I am, right? This is your state of being. Now, we have the be, do, have approach because we want to, we always have to remember, if having is what we want in the end, then... We have to start with a mindset, a frame of mind, mind, mind of being. So if you want to be successful, it's not about doing successful things so that you can have a successful outcome. You have to start with being a success-minded person. So you have to find out what that is and you have to become that first. Be successful in your mind. And then you will do, from your mind, you will do successful things. And then you will have, or do successful habits. And then you will have successful things. All right, that's how it is. Be, do, have. And the same thing as we were talking about adjusting our thinking. The way we think determines how we act. And so if we want to change how we behave, we have to change the way we're thinking. And so we have to recognize that there are two ways, just the same way we talked about two ways of types of healthcare, there are actually two ways of thinking as it relates to healthcare because of these two dim dimensions that we discussed. The first way is according to the illness model, according to sick care. And the second way is according to the wellness care model, according to well, well care, wellness care. So in the two ways, here's how they, they would look practically. In the illness model, which is the model that's taught to us by the pharmaceutical industry and all the ads that you see on TV, and even most of our doctors, unfortunately, they tell us to think in a particular way. In other words, if something is wrong, you, they will immediately tell you what you need to take. But you have to recognize that um, it's bigger than that. It is much bigger than that. So the idea is this. The way we think, according to the illness model, first, if something is wrong, our goal is to feel better. It's simple, it's, it's quick, it takes no effort on our part, we just hope to feel better. And so we try to see, we ask our doctors, Doc, what can you give me to take to feel better? Because their only goal is to feel better. Not recognizing that there are many ways to feel better without actually getting better. And if you feel better without getting better, and then you go out into your world and you start to be busy doing things while you're not actually better, you potentially can make yourself far worse in the end and further away from being better when it's all said and done. So we have to take this matter seriously. Seriously, people. So feeling better cannot be our goal. And so we, can't, we don't want to ask that question. We want to ask a different question. Instead of what can I take to feel better, we can ask the question, what do I need to do in order to get better? Because if we can get better, we have a, a much, I don't want to use the word better chance, but, you know, work with me, right? We have a much better chance of being well, yeah, if we want to get better. So getting better requires doing things that not only make us feel symptomatic relief or symptom wise feeling less but we want to go in a direction where we are optimizing how our bodies are working so that we can achieve a higher state of health than we currently have that's our goal getting better how about this one get well there are many people who have used the whole get well soon um 
notion, the whole get well soon argument. And they talk about, you know, I wish I could get well. Or, have you ever gone to the hospital and somebody is sick and you're going to visit them and you bring them a card? And what does the card say? Get well soon. Or balloons or teddy bear. Get well soon. Now, the notion of getting well is a notion that supposes that wellness is, a, is, is actually a position, a location, a destination, something to somewhere that one can get to. Like getting well is not somewhere to get to. It's not a destination. And so many people who think that it's a destination, they miss out because the whole process of wellness is a journey process, not a destination process. So getting well, if your goal is to get well, then you're basically just living a pipe dream. You're, you're wishing for your body to miraculously be in this state of wellness. And there's nothing in getting well that suggests to anybody that there is something that they need to do. Whereas true wellness requires ongoing effort. Because it's not just simply a matter of getting to a location. It's staying on a path of wellness. So rather than saying, boy... You know, I, I wish I could get well. How about, boy, I need to really make sure that I stay well. So when you say you want to make sure that you stay well, you're saying whatever it takes to improve my health, I want to maintain that so that my health can continue. So staying well is way more valuable than simply saying you want to get well. We live in a society in which we, unfortunately, we think of... Um, the longer somebody lives as an indicator as to how healthy they are or how healthy the set the, 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 um, the culture is. So if you're in a culture where you see the average life expectancy of a po in that population is 81 years, and you look at another population and say, what's the average life expectancy of that population? And you say it's 79 years. Then you would probably incorrectly assume that it means that the adults who are living in the first one that is 81 years are healthier than the adults that are living in the second one um, 79 years. Now, I'm going to show you how that's, that's not the case, right? Because the first thing that people don't understand about average life expectancy is that the average life expectancy is when you add up the total age of the population divided by the total number of people in the population. And the question is, what can impact average age the most? Now, if I were Minister of Health and I wanted to increase the average life expectancy, let's say in Jamaica it's 78.4, right? I don't know what exactly it is, but it's not too far from that, right? And I came into power and I said, I want to increase the average life expectancy. Where do you think I'm going to focus my efforts? Do you think I'm going to focus my efforts on the old people, trying to keep them living longer? Or I'm going to focus my efforts on the children? Remember, my, my, my um, tenure is only probably at most going to be five years, ten years maybe. So if I only have 10 years to increase life expectancy, who am I going to focus on? Children or old people? You can probably try to... Some people say children. One say children, Auntie Melissa, I hear you. Anybody wants to suggest something, suggest whether the same or something different? The old. Someone says the old. Anybody else? Just want to get a couple thoughts here, children. All right, so remember we said we only have 10 years, right? So let me ask this question, right? Let us say in a hospital every year we have about 1 in 1,000 births or 10 in 1,000 births um, resulting in death in infancy. Or death at birth. If we have persons dying at birth, then what ends up happening is 
we have a bunch of people whose age is zero added to the overall life expectancy by which you're gonna have to average everybody else. Now, if you can move from having five in every 1,000 or 10 in every 1,000 people dying, children dying in infancy, to only one in 1,000 children dying, that means four out of the 1,000 children that would have died are now living. And if they live past infancy, how long do you think they will live for? Maybe they'll live until they're a teenager. Maybe they live until they're in their 20s. Maybe they live until they're in their 80s. If you can save children from dying, what automatically ends up happening is that your average life expectancy number will go up by a lot because you've moved one person to making that person live 40 or 50 or 60 more years than what they otherwise would have lived. If you focus on an old person, the most you can probably get them to live longer might be five years at most. So instead of dying at 75, they may die at 80. Instead of dying at 80, they may die at 85. That's the most you can do. But if you can save a child from dying in childhood, then you can move that child from dying in childhood to dying in their 40s or 50s or 60s or, or even older. And so you can add decades to the calculation by focusing on the young. And this is kind of the secret behind countries that have life expectancy rates that are very high versus those who have it that are very low. It's not because people are older or you have more 100-year-olds in their population. No, it's because the child mortality rate is lowest in these countries. Mm, I bet you didn't know that. I hope it makes some sense. If it, if it makes sense, say amen, shout hallelujah, or just write it in the comment, whichever it is, but that's what it is. So staying alive is not the best measure of health. The best measure of health is feeling alive. It actually is your quality of life. It's how long, not how long you live, but how well you live. It's how you feel while you're living. What's the point in saying that you're alive if you can't feel no way, if you don't feel good, if, you're, if, you're, if you are suffering every single day of your life, what's the value in living? You understand? I mean, there is value, don't get me wrong. But for the person, you know, it's, it's a miserable existence. It is far better to be able to say, I feel alive because I enjoy the quality of life. Every single day I'm, I'm living, I'm feeling great. Much better. And so feeling alive. So what's a simple um, shift here? Instead of feel better, get well, and staying alive, our shift needs to be get better, stay well, and feel alive. So instead of get, stay, feel, or sorry, instead of feel, get, stay, we want to get, stay, feel. Instead of feel, get, stay, we want to get, stay, feel. Very useful, very important. And this is how we get people to behave differently, change the way they are, they are thinking, and you will change the way they act. That's the best way. Now, the second key is the truth about pain. Is pain a good thing or a bad thing? Some will say good. Some people say not so good. Some people say bad. The, 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 the truth of the matter is that there is a purpose to pain. Whether good or bad, there is a purpose to pain. What's the purpose to pain? Yes, it can be good. But it has a purpose, right? Pain tells us that something is wrong. Something has changed. Something needs our attention. That's it. That's what it does. It tells us there's something going on. Pay attention. Do something. Don't let it continue out of control. That's what pain tells us. The only thing is that there, there is a problem with pain, you see. Uh, what's the problem with pain? Pain can't be trusted. What do you mean? What, Dr. G, what do you mean pain cannot be trusted? That don't make no sense. Well, here's the, the, the reality of the situation. It is quite possible to have a problem for which there is no pain to warn you. And if pain doesn't warn you of a particular problem, then pain would have failed 
to be an appropriate signal for you that something needs your attention. And there are many conditions for which pain offers very little or late warning. One such example is cancer. How many times have you heard somebody with breast cancer in an interview say, you know what, one day I was, I was just lying in my bed and I felt a pain in my breast and when I went to the doctor, it turned out to be cancer. Not very often. What do you normally hear? You normally hear, one day I was lying in my bed and I, was, I had my hand rubbing against my breast and I felt a hard nodule in my breast. It wasn't painful. It was actually painless. I went and checked it out and it turned out to be cancerous. Because cancers oftentimes do not trigger a pain response until there's a lot of damage associated with the cancer, which is in the late stages, when, when cancer cells have already spread to other areas of the body and is breaking down tissue and so on. That's when pain comes in. But initially when the tumor is proliferating, there's usually no pain associated with cancer. So pain would have um, failed us in that regard. Pain would have failed us. All right. So good health is not the same thing as feeling good. And people need to understand that. Uh, I know a lot of people who come to me as, as, as patients and some of them, we start treating them, they start to get better, then their pain goes away, and as soon as their pain goes away, they disappear. Why do they disappear? They disappear because they're not feeling any pain anymore. And then I see them again once their pain returns. And that's the thing, is that we don't want people to be going back and forth between when they have pain and when they don't have pain because that's, that's how animals behave. You know, animals live according to a very simple principle. The pursuit of pleasure and the avoidance of pain. And so we don't want to live just like that. We want to live in a way that's higher than that. Feeling good though means we have good health. If we want to know if our health is good, we have to check our function. A healthy function means good health. What function are we talking about? That's a function of all the systems of our body. And we need to start trusting not how we are feeling, but how our bodies are working. Trust function, not feeling. Trust function, not feeling trust function not feeling so the functions that we're talking about are these the digestive system immune system nervous system musculoskeletal system integumentary system respiratory system excretory system reproductive system, and the endocrine system. These are the different systems of the body. And these are all the systems that we have to kind of pay attention to if we want to make sure that we are monitoring and tracking appropriately our state of health, our state of well-being. Well-being is a state of being well, well-being. So let's continue, right? Of all of these systems, obviously we should all know, I hope we do know, that every single one of these systems will communicate with at least one other system. I don't know if you know that, but that is true. Every system that you see here communicates with at least one other system. Um, what systems do we have communicating with what systems? They all do with each other, but there is one system, however, that not just communicates with another system, but communicates with every other system. And that system is what we call the master control system because it communicates with other systems and it can actually tell the other systems how to act, how to perform. So what do we see? We see this system and this system is, drum rolls please, the nervous system. So the third key is the nervous system. And what is particular about the nervous system? Thank you, Miss Melissa. The nervous system is the master control system of the body and spinal misalignments which are when bones of the spine get out of place they interfere with the nerves and are called vertebral subluxation so a vertebral subluxation is just the fancy term for a spinal misalignment 
Now, how does a spinal misalignment impact um, the nervous system? Or, yes, how does a spinal misalignment impact the nervous system? A spinal misalignment can impact the nervous system because when you look at the nervous system, you will see that the system has many different nerves that leave the spine that go to the different organs of the body but each of these nerves have to travel between the bones of the spine and if you interfere with the bones of the spine you will interfere with the nerves that travel between these bones potentially and that is very very important you want to make sure that you do not interfere with the nerves because when you interfere with the function of the nerves you're interfering with the functions of the body because the nerves control the different functions of the body in case you did not know so a vertebral subluxation is what we cause what is what causes nervous system dysfunction it's not the only thing but it's one of the most common things that will cause nervous system dysfunction. How might that look? If you look at this diagram here, you will see that there are five bones in this vertebral segment. The third bone, which is the middle bone, if you notice, is not lined up with the other bones above it or below it. And there's a problem because when they don't line up, there's more that also happens because the openings between the bones for example the opening here is where the nerves exit and if the bones when they line up provide the maximum opening for the nerves to travel then guess what happens when you shift a bone out of place like this middle bone if you shift the bone out of place, it, it shifts the position of the opening so that it closes off the segment where the nerves will have to travel. If you misalign the bone, you will potentially interfere with the, the signal that's able to pass through the nerve. Wherever that nerve goes to is what's going to be impacted by that nerve. Nerves that leave your head and neck. Nerves that leave your head and neck, or the, your neck region, control everything in your upper extremities. Nerves that leave your lower back control everything in your lower extremities. Nerves in the middle somewhere will control most of the middle things. So you can have a nerve that controls digestion by controlling how the stomach will send its signals. And if you interfere with that nerve, then you will interfere with digestion and the person will have digestive problems from a nerve misalignment, a, a, a spinal misalignment. And we see this all the time because when we realign the bones, we see the functions return. And so the question is, is it that you're saying that a misalignment can actually cause a bone to be, cause a nerve to, to stop working properly and therefore cause a symptom in the body like an organ symptom? Or are you saying that chiropractic can cure organ problems because chiropractic can't cure organ problems what chiropractic can do is restore alignment to the spine that's it that's all chiropractic can do but in restoring alignment to the spine if the nerves of the spine really do control the functions of the body then restoring alignment to the spine can impact and correct a lot of spinal spinally mediated problems like asthma, allergies, hypertension, um, dizziness, sinus issues, constipation, diarrhea, frequent urination, difficulty passing urine, uh, the list goes on and on, swallowing, acid reflux. But chiropractic doesn't correct those symptoms or those diseases, what chiropractic does is correcting spinal misalignment. And if you have a misalignment in the area of your spine where the nerves control that function and we can correct it, then those functions will return to normal. That's all I'm saying. 
Easy peasy. No hus no 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 hush no fuss. I know there's a saying. You know, but you know, I don't know it. I, I'm a young boy. Ish. Alright. So key number four is the key that talks about how stresses impact our health. Right? And there are three types of stressors that will impact our health. One is the physical. One is the biochemical and one is the psychological. There are those three. Very simple, straightforward. So the physical is like a car accident or a fall. Are you trying to tell me, Doc, that a fall or a car accident can cause asthma? Whoa, 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 whoa. Back up. Are you saying, Doc, that a fall or an accident can cause sinusitis? Whoa, whoa, whoa. Back up a little bit, Doc. Are you saying that a fall or an accident can cause acid reflux? Whoa, 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 wait, wait a minute. You're confusing me. Are you saying that, an as that, that a fall or an accident can cause hypertension? Are you serious? Well, if the nerves that control these blood vessels become affected, or these areas become affected, then you best believe that whatever it is that causes the nerve to stop functioning properly will cause the symptom to develop in time. Wow. Is, it why, is this the reason why, Dr. Gardner, you're, you, 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 you tend to see persons who have had a whiplash accident may even have rapid heartbeat, or their heart might be racing after they've had the, the accident, maybe not same time, but a couple years later? And the answer is, well, you tell me. We see it all the time. Have you experienced it for yourself? So this is kind of how these things work, all right? This is kind of how these things work. So you have the physical, which is car accident. You have the biochemical, which is chemicals that you either inhale, ingest through putting in your mouth, or absorbing through your skin with what you put onto your skin, or what you drink, or what have you. These are things that are biochemical in nature, like um, the deodorant that you use that can absorb into your bloodstream. You want to be very careful about the types that you use. The psychological stressor as well are things that involve the brain, the mind. For example, an example of a psychological stress is having a job that is stressing or stressful, or having a boss that is very demanding, or having a relationship at home that's not harmonious. These things can create stresses in our system that can result in us getting sick. Very important. So the healthier nervous system is, the better we are able to adapt to the stresses in our environment. And guess what? Chiropractic can help to improve the function of our nervous system. So let me kind of show you how this works, right? Let me show you how this works. There's an, a potential called the general adaptive potential. I'm using that gap analogy to explain how um, the adjustment of the spine can impact your overall ability to handle a stressor. So let's look at it, because this, this next slide will explain why people get sick, so that we can figure out how to fix it. And we're using the analogy of a gap. So in the analogy of a gap, we have a lower limit. Every gap will have a lower limit, right? And it will also have an upper limit, where the space between them represents the gap. If the upper limit is getting wider and wider and wider, then that means that you're approaching vitality. The wider your upper limit is the more things you can tolerate, the more things that you can adapt to. If your upper limit, however, falls down and down and down and down so that your gap gets smaller and smaller, this is what results in you approaching death. So the wider your upper limit is the more you're approaching vitality. As your upper limit is coming down and your gap is narrowing, you're approaching death. So that death occurs when your upper limit has gone down to zero. It means that you cannot adapt to anything else. That's when you're clinically dead. Dead bodies don't adapt. That's why you become one with your environment. You go back to the room temperature and you go back to dust because you can no longer adapt or counteract what's happening around you. So let's look at this because this is important. What causes the upper limit to be pushed down? 
The upper limit is pushed down by environmental stressors, ES, environmental stressors. And what is inside us that prevents this from happening? Our internal resistance. So environmental stressors versus our internal resistance. It's the tug of war between the two that results in the width of your gap. If your internal resistance is strong, your gap is likely to be wider. If your internal resistance is weak and your environmental stressors are high, then your gap will narrow and you will become sicker. If all of our experiences in life exist between the boundaries of our gap, we do not get sick, we don't break down. But once any portion of our experiences exceed the upper limit, that's where sickness occurs. So if we're going along our merry way and everything is going well, and now all of a sudden we realize that because we're not sleeping properly, our upper limit, our stressors have gotten so big that our resistance cannot oppose it anymore. And then our bodies start to break down and our upper limit comes down so that aspects of our experiences will now exceed the capacity of the body to cope. These red lines here represent where we are no longer adapting to our environment. Our environment has exceeded our adaptive potential. So the goal is we need to restore the width of our gap so that we can maintain the health of our system. Chiropractic, we realign the bones of the spine and by realigning the bones of the spine, we end up with a situation where the nervous system will operate at a more efficient, in a more efficient way. And if it does that, the gap will be wider because it's the nervous system that controls the width of our gaps. The wider our gap, the healthier we are. And chiropractic is one of those tools that can help to widen our gap. But it's not the only tool. There are other things that you'll have to do to improve the width of, our, of your gap. We're wrapping up now. Key number six is identifying subluxations. Now, we have specialized technology here at our office that we've invested in to allow us to, to help us to identify subluxations wherever and whenever they occur so that we can have a better sense, an objective sense of what is happening, right? Um, it's made up of two devices that we have here that we use for the spinal measurements. One is the, called the rolling thermography, which is a rolling thermal scan, this one on the left. That one, as we roll the thing up the back, it's measuring the temperature of the skin on either side of the spine, resulting in um, a measurement that can show us the differences between the two sides. That's the temperature scan. Wherever something has gone wrong in the spine, it may represent um, or show up as a change in the temperature. The next one is the muscle tone of the spine, and this is a surface electromyography re re registering the electrical muscle activity within the muscles of the spine. And as we go down through the spine, we are seeing changes in the muscle tone. When there is a subluxation or misalignment in the spine, it can impact this tone quite a bit. So these are the couple things that we will see. Now what is a chiropractor? A chiropractor is a specialist that works with the spine to impact the health. In a nutshell, that's what chiropractors are. We are specialists that work on the spine to impact the health of the person. How does chiropractic work is a different story. Does chiropractic work is a different story. So let's talk about the does chiropractic work part of it. Now, when you align the spine, you can change the way the brain sees the body. This is one study that actually demonstrated this. And so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to show this to you. When we're looking at the spine, what we see, or not the spine, this lady was given a task. And what was her task? Um, she was given a task to wiggle her left ankle, and then an image of her brain was done. 
the image was done before she had an adjustment and after the adjustment. In the images, what we saw was on the left hand side, this side over here, we saw a lot of areas of activity, lots of lights all over the brain. The more lights you have is the more active the brain is. So this left hand side image shows an, a brain that was very, very active for a simple, simple task. And it's not just the left or the right, it's the entire brain. And then now we have the lady was given an adjustment of the spine, the upper cervical spine, the neck, and the test was repeated. And what we saw in that case was areas of activity in the motor strip, which is the area that you would normally expect activity for this function, as well as some of the areas around it. So this is what we see. So on, your, on the right hand side, the diagram here is showing a much more efficient brain, whereas on the left hand side, it's showing a brain that is wound up too tightly, too much. All right? So I hope that kind of makes sense because this is what demonstrates that chiropractic does actually impact brain function. And so when we see it, the question is, what are chiropractors? Um, please don't ever answer that chiropractors are bone doctors. We are not bone doctors. Bone doctors are called orthopedists. Chiropractors are nervous system doctors because the work that we do impacts the nervous system much more than anything else. A chiropractic neurologist is a specialty within chiropractic, whereas chiropractors all realign the spine, but chiropractic neurologists retrain the brain. That's it. Chiropractors realign the spine, chiropractic neurologists retrain the brain. That's how we do what we do. And we do so non-medicinally and non-surgically. So, these are some um, different things that we have treated in our office using chiropractic neurology, non-medicinal approaches to neurological treatment, um, non-medicinal approaches to neurological treatment, and we do this and have made a significant difference in many, many children, or adults, or young adults, depending on the case. Now, we have a vision here, which is a fewfold, threefold. One is to identify substitutions wherever and whenever they happen. Two, to put people on a program of chiropractic care. Um, and three, is to educate our community. It's so important to be able to educate our community and to make wise choices. So these are our goals. This class is an example of how one of the ways that we choose to educate our community. We also have a radio program on RGR 94FM. So if you've not yet heard about it, you can follow us on Facebook or just go to RGR and look through the different archives and you can find um, Back to Health is the name of the show, Back to Health. So who's responsible for our health and well-being? The last key is this. The key to success in getting and staying well is for you to take responsibility for your own being, your own health and well-being. You are responsible for your own health and well-being. Nobody else is responsible for you. Your chiropractor is not responsible for you. Your parents, nobody's responsible. Unless, of course, you're a minor child, and then, of course, they become responsible. Um, this is a, one of our video testimonials that we have. I'm not going to play it now because you can just go to YouTube in our testimonial sections when you click on our um, link and see this very lovely, lovely um, interview. It is on our channel in our video section, one of the, um, what do you call it, playlists will have testimonials on it. So just click on testimonials and you can watch it. So here's a special offer as it's now 701. We don't want to go too much over, but we're at the last slide. So we're doing very well with time. There's a special offer for anyone who is on here tonight that um, 
are not yet a patient, but you will be interested in becoming a patient or um, at least getting an examination done. Let me explain that what this is, is just an opportunity to be evaluated or examined. It is not, an, it's not saying that by doing this, you're becoming my patient because even though the doctor-patient relationship officially starts once you consult with me, if I don't think I can treat you and I have to refer you to somebody else, then you're not really my patient. I'm not really, yeah, yeah, yeah what I'm saying? So what we try to do with persons is this. We try to um, have you understand that this is about you making an appointment to be evaluated. It's the evaluation that will determine whether I can help. And if I can help, then I'll suggest how. And if you are in agreement with the how, then you will accept my offer to help. And then once you accept that, I've initiated, you've responded, and so the doctor-patient relationship has been established at that point. So I'm not saying that if you want to become my patient, I'm saying if you want to be examined. So if you want to be examined, here's what you have to do. All you have to do is to indicate, not by show of hands, but indicate there's, you can indicate in the chat, or you can indicate by sending an email to the following person, and I'm gonna give you her information. And so, Um, hold on. Spelling is off. Good. All you have to do is just send an email to appointments at gcnjamaica.com. Indicate that you have watched the class and indicate that you'd like to be a part of it. Right? You'd be a part of our family by being examined. So if it is that you want to do that, just simply go ahead and do it and you will automatically receive a 40% discount. A 40% discount, that's a big discount in Jamaica. We don't really hear them kind of discount they have offered in Jamaica so much. But that's what you get, just for being a part of this presentation. Now, if you are an existing patient, you will get some other things in addition. So not only will you get a 20% discount off your update exam, you won't get 40%, you get 20% discount of your update exam, but you also get a 20% discount of one treatment per person that you refer. So if you refer two people, you'll get um, a 20% discount of two persons or two treatments. If you refer two people, another way of getting the, the same calculation done is receiving two 20% discounts of the same treatment, where that is actually a much, um, well, it depends on your case, whichever you prefer, right? So the only way this can work is if you give the person who you're referring to the office your name so that they can come and tell us who it was that offered or gave them the information that made them um, make the appointment so that we can know who to apply the discount to. And not only that, but you also get a 10% discount of the entire next phase of care. A phase of care is about 12 sessions. And if you get a discount of the next phase of care, you're getting a discount of the next 12 sessions plus any update exams that you're doing, which is a lot dollar value saved than before. That 10% alone is more money saved than the 40% for the new patient. Just in case you never realized. So just to, just to wrap up, our seven keys to getting and staying well, um, please understand that true healthcare is about being proactive with your choices. Not simply waiting for pain to kick in and take over, but being preventative and making sure that you're staying ahead of any symptoms. Do the right things, do wise choices, make wise choices so that your body does not break down with time. 
If you wait for your body to break down first, then the most you can do is restore yourself to good health. That's the most that you can do. But sometimes that's not even possible. So please make wise choices. Um, if you want to follow us online, the following are our um, different links to our website. It's gcnjamaica.com. gcnjamaica.com. On Facebook, you can follow our practice page at GCN Jamaica on Facebook, GCN Jamaica. On YouTube, you can type in Gardner Chiropractic. In YouTube, just type in Gardner Chiropractic in the search and it will take you to our channel. And finally, um, if you want to follow us on our radio show on rgr 94 fm all you have to simply do is just type in in your facebook search back to health talk show you could do, type that in without any spaces and it will take you to our channel back to health talk show no space and it will take you to our channel where you can observe what's happening and make choices um you know to watch participate whatever well we look forward to being able to see you here again. And we're at 707. We didn't do too badly for time. But it was a pleasure being able to share with you. Um, you know, we really want to make sure that we make healthcare accessible to most, if not all, persons if we can. I, it is my prayer that you will take what I have shared tonight seriously and you will start to implement some of it into your lives. Implementing even if it's just trying not to live by pain and trying to be proactive in your approach, not just simply waiting for pain to act up. All right? But it was a great pleasure being here with you tonight. I wish you all the very best as you make it home, what have you. And I pray God's blessings upon you. Continue to be blessed. Thank you so much for joining us tonight. It's 7.08. Spend time with your family. Have a wonderful good night. And enjoy everything, everybody. Take care.